One God, Amen. Today the church celebrates a great feast. And in fact, today is one of, uh, considered one of the seven minor feasts of the church. Because today we celebrate a new covenant. And today I want to discuss with you what makes this new covenant that we're celebrating today so special. But first let's discuss what is a covenant. First, a covenant, we're going to say four things. First, a covenant defines a relationship between two parties. A covenant is between two parties. Some covenants, number two, some covenants are conditional. So party A does something and then party B will do something else. Some covenants are, are unconditional and just party A will do something regardless of what party B will do. Number three, covenants are often uh, include the slaughter of animals as a symbol of their significance or they're signed by blood. So usually there's some blood shed in the covenant. Number four, covenants do not have expiration dates. They don't uh, fade out. They don't, uh, it's not just applicable for a certain time period. They're everlasting. In Deuteronomy it says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love and keep His commandments. And in the Old Testament, God made covenants with many people. So I want to review some of the covenants that they made so that we can see how special the covenant is that we're celebrating today. One of the earliest covenants was with Noah, the righteous Noah. And he made a covenant with Noah and said, I establish my covenant with you that shall never again, that never again shall all flesh be cut off from the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is an example of an unconditional covenant. It's uh, sometimes called the Royal Grant Covenant. There's nothing that Noah did for this or his descendants must do, but God will fulfill this covenant just because that's what God wanted to do. The next covenant that I want to look at is the covenant of Abraham. Because every covenant, it gets a little better. Every covenant, it's going to get better. So let's look at the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham started when he was Abram or Abram in Genesis 15. And God made a promise to Abraham and said, Lord, look towards heaven, the number of stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him as righteousness. So then the Lord asked him to bring a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And they were cut. Because we said covenants, sometimes they have blood in them. And they laid them on different parts of each other. And then this is the interesting part. As, about, as they were about to sign the covenant, usually there was like a little procession, they would walk through this path, that Abram fell asleep. The Lord put him to sleep. It says, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, while he's sleeping, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs, and will be their servants there. They will be afflicted for four hundred years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete." And then this is the part that gets really interesting. Because Abraham was asleep during the covenant, it's written that when the sun had gone down, it was written, it was, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these, pla between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I will give this land to the river of Egypt, to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Canaanites, Cadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Zebu Jebusites. What's the point of all this? That actually Abraham was sleeping during this covenant. And the torch and the lamp was like God making a covenant with himself. God the Father making a covenant with God the Son because he knew Abraham wasn't going to fulfill the covenant. On himself and if you don't fulfill the covenant what is the punishment 
death. So it's like the Lord took upon himself the covenant. And as a sign of the covenant, because Abram was sleeping during this whole ordeal, he gave Abram a sign. In Genesis 17, he said, Now I'll call you Abraham, and there will be a sign of the covenant. What will be the sign of the covenant? The circumcision. So he gave the circumcision in Genesis 17 as a sign for the, for the covenant. That was a very nice covenant. Then after Abraham came the covenant of Moses, the Lord made a covenant with Moses. He said, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak uh, to Israel. So here you see if Moses obeys and his descendants obey, they will be this conditional covenant. They will be a holy priesthood. They will be a, a royal nation. But there was one thing missing from this covenant that was fulfilled in the next covenant. Because everyone gets a little better. There was no leader for these people. Who's going to lead these people? So the next covenant that I'll talk about is the covenant with David. And the Lord made a great covenant with David. And he made a, a, a covenant that said, When your days are complete, you will lie down with your fathers. I will raise a descendant after you who will come forth from you. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with a rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men, but my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Here we see the unconditional covenant. And even when Solomon started to be wicked and started to stray from the commandments of God, the Lord said, I remember the covenant I made with David and I will not remove even I'll take 10 of the tribes away but there will be descendants for you for the sake of my servant David because of his covenant these were like we went through four or five covenants through these covenants they were promised descendants land law the mosaic the law of Moses came from the mosaic covenant and in the Davidic covenant we see a king and now in the new covenant, we see fulfillment of all these four things. The king, the law, the land, the descendants. Because now in the new covenant on this day, the Lord instituted a new covenant and fulfilled those four things. He said, take drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many to be given for the remission of sins. Because Christ came to be the new king. Now he is the king. He has fulfilled the Davidic covenant of being a king. And Christ is the everlasting king. And we talked about many, I gave many ideas of this on Palm Sunday. So I won't go through all the details of how Christ fulfilled the kingship. The law. Christ came to fulfill the law of Moses. Because actually, as I said, all the covenants, they kept getting better. There were some problems with the covenant of Moses, some maybe deficiencies in the law. One of the deficiencies was, who could keep the law? Who could keep it? We were all guilty of breaking the law. In James 2 it says, for whoever keeps the whole of the law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And there was no forgiveness in the Old Testament. None. No forgiveness. In Hebrews 10 it says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins of every year. For it is not possible, in Hebrews 10, St. Paul says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's not possible that the blood of goats could take away sins. So there was some deficiencies with the law. But Christ came to, make, to fulfill the law. The second problem with the law is the law could not make you better. It couldn't make you better. How does the law make you better? If I have a list of rules, the rules don't make you better. In Romans 8, it says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in His likeness, of, in, 
his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, God came to fulfill the law on our behalf because the law couldn't make us better. Number three, the law, we couldn't remember the law. You know how long the law of Moses, have you tried to read in Leviticus, try to keep all the laws? It's too much. And it is, but in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, what's written, and this is what was prophesied even in Jeremiah, he said, for this is the covenant, this is about the New Covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my laws within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is the beauty of the new covenant. Now the, the new law is written where? In your hearts. Another thing in the new covenant, we have a helper. We are reading the Gospel of John. There was a verse that was very nice in the Gospel of John. It says, now in the new covenant, God dwells within us through the work of the Holy Spirit. It says, our Lord says in John 14, he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. In the new covenant, in through the mystery of the Eucharist, we have God within us. That's the new covenant. A key feature of the new covenant, and this was something not even prophesied in the old, is everlasting life. The old covenants didn't give you everlasting life. There was death in the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, there is a promise for everlasting life. In the New Covenant, we see that the New Covenant is for all people. Christ came and died for all people. There is no longer a select nation. It is for all people. A key feature of this covenant is grace. You know, in John chapter 1, it says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In this covenant, there is forgiveness of sins. There is cleansing by the blood of Christ on the cross. Some of the key features of this covenant, some of the beauty of the participating in the Eucharist, I just want to share a few beautiful things about them, that we can, some lessons about the Eucharist, is that because we have the Eucharist, Christ is among us, within us. We said the law is inside us. That's why the other day we were talking about the word of God being inside us, and I asked, how old, or how old is our tradition, or how old is the Lord, like, how long ago did the Lord Jesus Christ live on the earth? Can you imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ, he lived on the earth 2,000 years ago? 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago? To me, it seems like he lived 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Why does, it see, why does 2,000 years ago seem like so little, seem like nothing? Because, as we said, the Word of God is inside you. We have the Gospel, we read the story. It's like we know Jesus very, like, very personally. We partake in his mysteries every week. We see the Lord Jesus Christ every, every week. Every day, in our relationship with God. He is not 2,000 years ago. That's one of the beauties of the sacrament of the Eucharist. It takes us back to the day of the crucifixion. It takes us back to... The, there's no time here. It's beyond time. We are going back to that very day of the crucifixion. That's the beauty of the New Covenant. Another beauty of the New Covenant is that it's not tied to a space. The new covenant's not tied to a space, not to a location, not to a specific. Every altar takes us back to one spot, and that's the place where Christ instituted this mystery. Takes us back to the cross. I've had in the very short, uh, my very short uh, life as a priest, I've had the blessing to pray on many altars in many different places. And I'm sure maybe the, the other fathers, they've prayed in many more altars everywhere. But one thing I've noticed, and I would love maybe they could get the, you can get their opinion, every altar is the same. 
Every altar is the same. Why is every altar the same? Because every altar has the same sacrifice. Every altar takes you to the same place. Be like if the cross is standing here and this altar is like here and then this altar is here and this altar. But they're all looking at the same place. Don't tell me a fancy church. Don't tell me a very poor church. Don't tell me a very big altar. Don't tell me a very small altar. All altars, said the uni, they're all the same. They're all the same because there is one sacrifice. On that point too, every liturgy is the same. Whether there's a bishop praying, whether there's a thousand priests praying, whether there's one priest praying. Every liturgy is the same because it's the same sacrifice. The same sacrifice on the altar. I wish that every time we partake of this sacrifice, we remember that we are going back to the same event. We're pointing at the same direction. The last thing I'll leave you with is that we shouldn't take this new covenant, covenant for granted. We shouldn't take this new covenant for granted. That's why many of the homilies that were written, uh, like that we read this week, I'll read just a part from St. John Chrysostom. He says, I want to remind you with what I repeatedly reiterated to you concerning our communion with the Holy Sacraments, which is Christ. I see in you a state of extreme looseness, permissiveness, an alarming audacity and lamentable recklessness. I weep over my condition and ask myself, do these people really know for whom they stand? Or do these people realize the power of this sacrament? As at this thought, I become angry reluctantly. The idea that the power of this sacrament, we shouldn't come to this sacrifice, just hmm, another, another. The awesomeness of this sacrifice is very powerful. Truly, we believe that this is my, f my flesh, the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, sh we shouldn't come to the sacrifice in a state of permissiveness. Oh, just wake up and roll into church. No, we should come repenting. We should come eagerly. We should come longing to partake in this great mystery. This new covenant is amazing. It's amazing. It gives everlasting life. No other covenant was like that before. I hope we take this covenant seriously. And glory be to God forever. Amen.